how is your meditation? Is, your, is everyone meditating all right? Are there any questions about meditation? Meditate tutti e come va la vostra meditazione? Se c'è qualche domanda riguardo alla meditazione. Okay. We have a few questions. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, okay. okay, grazie. She starts. <laughs> Le chiedo durante la meditazione come si può mantenere l'attenzione sul respiro e sull'occhio spirituale mm -hmm. per non distrarsi. Okay. During meditation, how is it possible to keep focus on the breath um, while meditating on Kriya Yoga and on the third eye? When well, you first sit, first sit to meditate, put your attention up there. And with practice, you can just learn to be there. You don't have to try to be there. You just start out. And because you're, you're going to be thinking and you're going to be deciding what to do next. So just work, operate from here. Just instead of down here, get up here. I sort of look in there, just look in there. Like that. You tell her? Uh, we're going to translate everything after. Oh, afterward. Anche come mantenerla, cioè perché la domanda ci ricorda. Come mantenere a lungo e non distrarsi. She's asked how to keep focus for a long time and not get distracted. You have, that's why you have, well, first of all, you have. A strong desire or aspiration to be successful in meditation. So you, that, that's why you set up and you put your attention here and you stay very alert. And then if attention wanders, then you that's why that's why we have meditation techniques or methods like Kriya Pranayama or Mantra or breath, watching the breath. We have some We do something with our mind, with our attention, so that we stay focused. If we just sit there like this, pretty soon we're all over the place. We're daydreaming, we're thinking, and we're half asleep, and so forth. So if you stay focused, stay right here, and do something. Pray, or chant, or affirm, or watch the breath, or do Kriya Pranayama, do something. And then, eventually, When your mind is very calm, then just let that all go and just be there, just be in the stillness. Like that. That's the, that's the way, just be very, get right in there and stay very alert, very focused. All right. And then attention will wander, then you bring it back and you try again. Until you, until you're able to do it. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Okay. Well, when when uh, Paramahansa Yogananda meditated with a group, if you wa observe, watched him, observed him, he would get go inside and he would. Just, He didn't move. He was just like a rock for for an hour or two. He just absolutely there. So it's just a matter of practice and intention, having the intention. And then shorter meditations, like 20 minutes, to 30 minutes, that are very alert and focused are better than long meditation where you're just sitting there like this. You know, better, better to be very alert and focused. And uh, it just comes with practice. Okay, practice. When I was at uh, the first two years when I was with, with Master, I was in Phoenix, Arizona, about 400 miles away from Los Angeles. I meditated every morning, but because I was a, a monk, I, never, I had plenty of time for meditation, 
So I meditated every morning from about three o'clock in the morning to seven, to about four hours. And I did that for almost four years. And it was a good experience. I, I did it because I wanted to experience it and see what would happen. So I, I, learned, I, learned, I learned that it's possible to sit. And sometimes you catch yourself and your attention is wandering, you're daydreaming, but then you get back there again. And sometimes I would, <coughs> as I was med <coughs> meditating alone, uh, when I needed to really get back in there, I would uh, do some uh, audible chanting, Om, 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 or one, of, or one of the devotional chants that Yogananda had composed, you know. Uh, just to get involved again. Then when I got involved and focused, then I let the, let the chanting go and just be still again. Or do Kriya Pranayama. Or uh, do you have one of these? So yeah. I, well, mm -hmm. You can do that. You can... Having the hand position, the hands like this, helps to concentrate here. So, but uh, uh, a ma master always, always emphasized that uh, after using a meditation method, whether mantra or pranayama or prayer or chanting. You know, after that, always sit in the silence. Just be there in the silence. And that's a good time also to meditate on Om. Imagine Om everywhere present. And imagine that you are blending with that and that your awareness is expanding in that. And uh, after a while then meditation just occurs by itself. We just, we don't have to work at it and we don't have to try anymore. It just, it just flows, it just happens. And we sort of give ourselves to it. That's the, when you find that you're just like, that it's just working by itself, you're just surrendering, giving yourself to it. And that's the most, that's the easiest way to meditate. And it's just, it's just you're just there. And it's very, very peaceful, very enjoyable, easy, not difficult. But uh, until then, many beginning meditators, until then, they have to get to that stage, you know, they're tense, they're restless, their mind is busy. But eventually you get to the place where it just flows naturally, you're just there. So... Uh, I, uh, uh, hopefully, that's the best, the best thing that can happen is when you get past that, get past the resistance and past, past the difficult time, and, and it's just happening, just occurring naturally. And that's, that's, the, that's the most satisfying way to meditate. Then after a while, you can just, when you time to meditate, you can just sit And just be there almost immediately. Just shift right into it. So you don't have to, don't have to work at it anymore. It just it's just easy. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Mr. Davis, qual è la ragione fondamentale per cui è importante aderire ad un sentiero spirituale come il Kriya Yoga? Mm -hmm. What is the fundamental reason why it is important to adhere to a spiritual path such Kriya Yoga? Well, we have to do something to stay focused. 
uh, the spiritual the spiritual path or practice, as I mentioned this morning, is simply for clearing our awareness so that we we are we can we know know ourselves, know our spiritual essence, and that's the purpose of spiritual practice. And um, of course, the Kriya Yoga, as you know, Kriya Yoga, according to Patanjali, uh, is composed of right uh, disciplined thinking and living inquiry what am i what is my true nature what is my relationship with god or this ultimate reality and uh, seeing through and beyond this small sense of self identity which is the we call it ego which is the small sense of self the personality, you know, seeing through that. And that's, that is basically what potentially defined as Kriya Yoga. The Kriya means action or procedure. And the, the result of right practice is yoga or the union, the coming together, holding together of attention and awareness with our, with our essence. In the preliminary stages, there may be temporary samadhi or union with what we are observing, such as we may feel like we are one with light, or one with sound, or one, or one with uh, extreme pleasurable sensation, bliss. But these are only temporary perceptions. But uh, they're all right, but they're, they're temporary. So beyond them is that state of a pure awareness that is not supported by any any thoughts or or sensations at all. It's just the awareness of pure existence, pure existence, and uh, that's the that's the final stage. Before that, we may have a sense of and many many people do when they meditate. You know, they say after they say. Oh, I felt so blissful, oh, so wonderful. Or I saw light, and I felt like I was light. Or I heard sound, and I felt like I was. Those are preliminary, preliminary samadhis or oneness perceptions, but they don't they don't last. They they, they go away. And uh, but if we can get to the place where we experience our essence, what we are. And that that's permanent. That's permanent. And after a while, we can have that awareness all the time, even when we're interacting like this, performing our work, making our food, doing whatever we do. Inwardly, we we are always aware of what we are, and, and that's the ideal. So. But from my, from my observation and my experience, it, it just takes time to, to, to focus and to stay, stay aware, to, see, to, 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 to finally wake up and have those experiences. Many of my, some of my brother disciples, sister disciples that I knew back years ago in the 1950s, very nice people and good meditators, and very compassionate, and so forth. But they were not self-realized at that time, because they were still at the level of devotion, and service, and love, and all these good things, but they hadn't gotten past that to the experience of what they were. So they weren't self-realized yet. Only a very, only a very few of, of Master's disciples uh, were spiritually enlightened that he pointed, pointed to and said, this person has it, this person has it, this person. And most people were, 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 were good people, but they were devotional devotees. They were not, were not self-realized. Um, even though Master kept encouraging everyone to wake up and become be self-realized, but it's not easy, obviously. If it were easy, there'd be more people. More, more people. There'd be more enlightened people if it was easy. So. 
So. Um, se deve fare un bilancio della sua vita, lei direbbe di aver fatto tutto quello che doveva o direbbe, non so, di non aver fatto niente personalmente? If you were to make a balance of your life, you would say that you have done everything you had to or technically you have done anything? I've always seen what I do as, as service. <laughs> as a duty. Okay. So, when I was very young, I I felt that, that it was my destiny, my duty to serve in this way. And then uh, after I met Paramahansa Yogananda, he, I was with him and then he ordained me. And, or, and so ever since, it, to me, it's been something that I do. I, uh, i haven't done it because to make money and I haven't done it for fame. I just do it as service. And uh, so as long as I'm able to do it, I'll keep, I'll keep doing it. That's all. Right. Thank you. So, so I've been doing it now for 65 years. <laughs> so, Pretty long time. So I'll keep on doing it. <laughs> But. Uh, And I've seen a lot of, a lot of uh, useful things happening as a result. A lot, of, a lot of changes in the world, of course. But uh, mainly what my observation is what most people need is Frequent, constant, frequent reminding of the, of the basic, basic principles, the basic ideas, reminding and encouragement. And because beyond that, I don't, we can't force things. We can't force. We can't make things happen. At least I haven't been able to. Um. Posso fare una domanda? Uh, il pensiero crea la realtà? E se sì, come? Um, thoughts creates reality? Mm -hmm. And if so, how? You say thinking creates reality? You mean we're, we're talking about creating our personal experiences? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, We are inclined to attract to ourselves what we think about and to do something to make it happen too. So if we, if we have a clear-cut picture in the mind and we can imagine what it is we want to experience, we can do things to help bring it into manifestation or attract, attract it to us. Attract the circumstances and the people that can make it, resources that make it possible. But the, of course, our thoughts don't create this reality. I, I didn't create okay. this. Yeah. But as far as creating, producing, create, creating our world, our, our personal experiences, mm -hmm. yeah, our mental attitude makes a big difference, positive difference. Can be positive difference. Okay. If we are optimistic, and uh, have a lot of faith and belief, uh, that, that's more useful than if we're pessimistic and negative and, and can't believe, you know. But I don't know how it is in, in uh, Italy and other parts of Europe, But in America, there you probably know from reading the news, a lot of people are mentally and emotionally un unsettled mm. uh, because of uh, international international conflict. And as I mentioned this morning, um, strong, strong likes and dislikes and differences of opinion that people express in not only person to person, but now on the internet, you know, that 
at, uh, on Facebook and yeah. Twitter and so forth. It goes worldwide instantly. Mm. And uh, so we have a, and now in America right now, we have political unrest. We have our president and others who are not, who are not very, not very comforting, they, they make, <laughs> making people nervous. <laughs> Okay. But thankfully, this will all passes away eventually. You know? we've, we've gotten through some pretty interesting experiences over the past several decades. World wars and her, her, you know, volcanoes and hurricanes and, and economic depressions. We've gotten through it all. So I think the future, the future is, is good. The future is positive. I have one last question, Sir Davis. Um, regarding the Kriya Yoga path, regarding Kriya Yoga mm. path, what are the main suggestions you would give on meditation practice and on the spiritual path? Well, basically, just follow the guidelines in the Yoga Sutra as far as Kriya Yoga practice, you live a good, moral life, a good life ethical and moral life. That is, be, be kind to people, be kind to all forms of life, and be honest, be truthful, and uh, be self-disciplined, and uh, constantly inquire what is my true nature, what is my relationship with the infinite, that ultimate reality, and just stay on that track. And, it, and supplement that inquiry with meditation practice. That's it. It's very serious. It's not difficult. The, the idea is not difficult. It's not always easy to stay on it. Because so many people tend to go off, I'll try this or I'll try that. Uh, or, or it's not working, I'll quit now. I'll go pick it up later, maybe, mm -hmm. and so forth. You know. But uh, in 1920, in 1920, when um, Master got, was ready to come to America, Sri Yukteswar went to the boat where he was, where he was. He was getting ready to leave Calcutta to come to America. And Sri Yukteswar said, in America, teach the Kriya Yoga of Patanjali, that is in the Yoga Sutras. So that's what Master did all, all of these years. And uh, yeah, in the early years, in his 20s and 30s, when he traveled and lectured and attracted big crowds of people, he had lecture titles, lecture themes that attracted people. But once they, once they gathered, then he taught them how to chant and how to meditate and emphasized his meditation practices. And some of his public lectures were such lectures in the 1920s were uh, how to uh, how to how to how to find friends of previous incarnations, <laughs> and uh, and uh, how to develop your 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 divine and magnetic healing powers and so forth. These are all these are all designed to attract the public. And once you got there, then after you talked about that for a while, he said, "Now let's meditate." All right. <laughs> <laughs> Pick up the harmonium, he'd lead chanting. And, and when he led chanting, he, he just didn't talk, chant for five minutes. It might be 15, 20 minutes, just over and over and over and over <laughs> again. And then finally, he put the, put the harmonium down. And sit for 30, 40 minutes in absolute silence. And these big crowds of people would do it. It was something new back in the 1920s and 1930s. I'd never seen anyone like that. You could, you could attract a thousand or two thousand people and get them all involved in uh, meditation practice. But he attracted them with these popular topics. Okay. But uh, but in his later years, he still he still talked about. He talked, he talked every Sunday morning in Hollywood at the Hollywood SRF Temple. And he had a provocative titles, but it was always within 20 minutes he was back, back on the basics of Kriya Yoga practice. And uh, yeah. 
He was very wonderful to be with. You can tell from his picture, photographs of him, pictures. Uh, he was just uh, very warm and intimate and friendly. And uh, when, you, when you were with him, you felt that you were the most important person in the world. He just gave you complete attention. And uh, when I went to see him, I said, uh, uh, I, I went to see, every two months. I went over, over to California to spend time with him. And when I was talking with him privately, he always had me sit very close like this, so we were only about this far apart. Because he liked to get real close like this, so our faces were about this far apart. And uh, I, I guess in India, so in some cultures, it's it's sort of a cultural thing where you get very close. <laughs> and he was like that. With strangers, he was, you know, a little more, you know, you have a little, little space, a little distance, and be very polite, very courteous, very appropriate. But with disciples, male disciples, he got real close. So you were like, right, almost shoulder to shoulder. And, and talked to you like a father or an uncle, you know. And uh, you felt, you just felt, Magnetized, you felt just drawn into his in, into his personality, very close. And, uh, so when I was with him, he mostly just uh, he very seldom asked me any questions or or asked if I had questions. He just talked, told me about his experiences with Sri Teswar, and encouraged me to be steady with my meditation. And. Uh, just basically, just uh, it was very supportive and very warm and uh, uplifting all the time. And I, I, I seldom went went with him with any questions because just being with him personally. Uh, that was the great blessing because you just felt his strength and his, his magnetism and his power, spiritual power. And uh, and then uh, I, I knew that I would eventually. Uh, Teach, uh, but uh, when I was there in the 1950s, early 1950s, they, they didn't have any plans for, uh, for their training plans for the monks. Or right, you just went there and you worked and you meditated and you were with Yogananda. And when you were ready to represent the teaching, then he would say, "Come over here," and he would talk with you and say, "Now you teach, you do it." But he, it was only when, you, when he thought you were ready that he would say, do it. Before that, he would say, no, you're not ready yet, and so forth. So, and when I was ordained, I wasn't ready to teach. I was just a child, only 20 years old. You know. What did I know? I didn't know anything. Not very much. But uh, I learned. I learned by, by participating, by doing. I learned. And so I had him as an example. And then, and then when I began to travel and lecture, and I learned, I learned how to do, uh, talk with publishers and get printers and get books published. I learned how to get them distributed. I learned how to arrange public talks. And I learned how to talk. We do uh, back in the sixties. I did. Uh, we had, um, back in those days, we had um, several television and radio interview shows in most cities. And so I would, I, I would appear on those local programs, be interviewed for 30 minutes or so, and talk about meditation and yoga, and where I was speaking so people could come. You know. So I did that. And then I moved up here in 19... 72. I lived down in Florida before this, 
south, about 600 miles south of here. And then, uh, so in the early 1970s, I moved up here. I mean, we've been, so I've been here since then. And we're the only retreat center in, in this part of the country uh, that teaches yoga. There's one other yoga center up in, in, in a nearby state in Virginia. And uh, we're the only yoga, uh, or only the only Korea yoga center uh, in this part of the country. Oh. Several in California, but on the East Coast, not many, and we're the only one in the South. So, <coughs> so people come here from all over the, all over the United States. And, uh, of course, I grew up, I mean, you've seen a map of the United States. I grew up in Ohio, up north. Near just south of a city, city called Cleveland. I grew up on a farm, milking cows, <laughs> pitching hay, <laughs> and uh, doing what farm boys do. Worked on the farm. Here we're we're in the foothills, right in the beginning of what is called the Appalachian Mountain. It was one of the oldest mountain ranges in the world. Mm. Mm. But from here it goes north, all the way north. Mm. So we, this is just the beginning to put in. So we're 2,000 2, feet elevation here. And uh, so we're uh, at, a, at a nice place. Which it, it's, the air is, air is pure, quiet environment. So it's a, it's a good place for, for an ashram. Ashram, should, the word ashram means a, a quiet place set aside for spiritual study and reflection. So ashram should be in a quiet place. And 60% uh, of the land area in this, in this region is uh, designated as National Forest. Oh. So it, it, that's why you have so many trees and the mountains uh, in the mountainous area. Uh, and it, it will never be overly developed uh, because I say 60% is set aside as National Forest. So you, you're not allowed to build on, in, in the forest. So, and we have three lakes. We have one lake here, and then another lake north, of, two lakes north of here. And uh, so it's a, it's a very nice place. And quiet here, as you can tell, it's out in the building. I stay here most of the time. Uh, I, don't, I don't travel much anymore. I used to travel years ago a lot, but I don't travel much anymore. Uh, every January I go south uh, down to Florida for one month and vac vacation uh, next to the uh, Atlantic Ocean. And while I'm there, I have one public, public pr uh, event at a hotel. Then in March, I go to California uh, every year for one weekend, we have a, a big event there. But those, but those are the only place, places I go. Although I'm, I'm going to speak in Atlanta uh, two weeks from now, uh, but uh, at a public at a public event, we have a hotel hotel room uh, arranged for, it. and advertising is out down there. So we expect. There may be 200 or so will show up. But I, I did it. We're doing it mainly to, to introduce the new book. Oh. So make it available to the public. That's what the yeah, master looked like when I knew him. Era così quando l'ho incontrato. And of course, that's it. Master in St. Lane, you saw St. Mr. Mm -hmm. Lane's picture yeah. over there. Yeah. 
He was a, he was an amazing person. Era una persona fantastica. Mm. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, Diane Mata, she was president. And uh, she was the most recent president. And she died last year. This is the center in Phoenix where I was the minister. Now they have a big, beautiful temple there at another location. But this, this is when they first started out in 1940, 1948. These, they, uh, master dedicated that in 1948. And I was, this is, I was 20 years old here after I, I became the minister there. Aveva vent'anni quando ha cominciato ad essere ministro. Mm -hmm. So, this is at the dedication of uh, uh, what is called the Lake Shrine. It, it's a uh, retreat facility in Southern California that. Yogananda uh, dedicated, and that photograph was taken on that occasion. And the uh, same photograph is back there. I, ha I had an interesting experience on that occasion. Two experiences. Uh, I was invited to be there. So I, just, I, I had this idea in my mind that if I did my Kriya Pranayamas and got myself prepared. Then when I got to California, I <clears throat> had a chance to talk with Master, <clears throat> that I could ask him for a samadhi. He would reach out. And <laughs> so I meditated and did Kriya Pranayama and went to the dedication service. There were about 600 people there. And after the people left, Master continued to sit up, up front on a little raised platform like this, and Mr. Lin was sitting beside him, and he was meditating like this. He was just... But, and people were coming by to see Master. And I came by. I was the last one. And I... Uh, he, he, said, he, he said, how's my boy? And, uh, we, and I said, sir, I, I said... I leaned forward and he put his ear down. I said, will you give me samadhi? I thought he was here. Hmm. I caught him off guard and he said, what? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I asked him again and he reached over and he touched Mr. Lin on the knee. He said, he wants samadhi. <laughs> and Mr. Lin Lin, oh, bless his heart. <laughs> and he went back into meditation. Then Nasha patted me on the head and he said, you go now. <laughs> so I went over to stand, I went, I went over and, and, uh, about oh, 20, 30 feet away, waiting for <laughs> one of the fellows to come and say it was time to, to get in the car and go back up to headquarters. And I was standing there and Mr. Lynn came by. He'd been out for, went out for a walk and he came by and he saw me and uh, when he, as he walked by, I went like this. And he stopped. He, he walked over to me. Didn't say anything. Just walked over to me. And he put his, this hand, he put it on my, like that, on my forehead. And this hand, he put right here, on my, over my ear. And he pushed me back and looked like, he just to sort of help me relax. Then it felt all of a sudden like there was, like he'd had a syringe with, full of liquid joy, you know, right here. You know, and my breath was temporarily stopped, and I felt filled with this ecstatic sensation. As soon as that happened, he backed off like this, and what walked away, and I'm standing there, go, in this blissful state, and gradually it faded. But uh, so I didn't get it from Master, but I, I had a nice ecstatic experience with Mr. Lin. But that was not it. Uh, But it amazed me, I thought about it later, it's amazed me how he could do this with his hands. I guess he could put energy in my chakras or something, get things activated. And how he knew when it worked, because as soon as it happened, when he backed off and walked off, he left me standing there like that. It was an interesting experience.
and experience big experience yes. a big experience yeah it was good yeah. i was very fortunate in those early days to have master and mr lynn and one or two other very good examples mm -hmm. Era molto fortunato avere grandi esempi come i massimi. I just see them and they, they, they were good examples of this of the creative of the path. Yeah. Unique. Unique. So, yoga Rana faceva praticare spesso, io faccio yoga e esercizi di carica. Um, Yogananda used to practice Uh, hatha yoga with you and and exercise sometimes uh, he recommended that they be done uh, he didn't practice with us now and then he would uh, one time I was out with, out with him for a walk and he, he uh, I remember where he paused and he went That was the extent. <laughs> but he didn't go, he didn't go through the whole routine. And he, he never told me to practice them, but I practiced them because when I first went there at the morning meditation with all of the fellows, all of the monks, about 20 of us, we would go out on a tennis court and uh, early morning about 6.30 and do the energization exercises. And Kriyananda was there at the time. He was the head monk. You saw the picture in the back, yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, so we did, we did the routine then. Then we went in to the chapel and meditated for 30 minutes. And then we had breakfast, then we started our, our work day. We had job responsibility on the, on the ground. So. But when I went over to Phoenix, I didn't do the energization on a regular basis. Uh, you know, Master innovated those. They're not part of yoga. Master created them. And well, when he was still in India in 1917, 1918, there was a, at that time, well, in the early 1900s, there was a, there was a German man who traveled all over the world and gave demonstrations of strength, lifted heavy weights, and also mu muscle posing, showing muscles. And uh, his, name was, his stage name was Eugene Sandow. And Master read an article about him in a book uh, he, where he wrote that when he traveled on trains and so forth, that he didn't always have, it wasn't convenient to be at a gym to work out with weights. And he practiced muscle tension, relaxation of his muscles, just keeping his muscles toned up. So the master being a yogi thought, oh, that's interesting. So then he got the idea, why not combine that muscle tension and tension with using will to send energy from the base of the brain to the muscle part and let it withdraw with the exhalation. So he said, inhale and tense, exhale and relax. Inhale and charge the muscles, exhale and relax. So he, then he created about oh, 30 different movements for that purpose. And uh, so they became known as the energization exercise routine. He created that and he had the idea from what he read about this using Sanda, the muscle man who demonstrated in the public. So uh, it's not part of yoga, but it's all right. It's, people will do it. And as you know, uh, anyone can learn it now, it's on YouTube. Oh, yeah. you, 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 you go in there and search on, on YouTube, search for Yogananda Energization. And one of the Ananda, Ananda members in California mm -hmm. demonstrates it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. 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 Honoring and meditating on a divinity are two things that are on the same level, or one is more prominent than the other, or one is mm, not harmful, but... Yeah, okay. 
meditating on, on, on a divinity or a, or a nice aspect of God. Like, for instance, like, yeah. for instance, example. Shiva. 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 If it's, if it means, if it means something to you, all right. Okay. If it means something, yeah. So for some people, for some people, you, you, you say Shiva, they don't know what you're talking about, so it doesn't mean anything. Okay. It's like uh, many, many people with the interpretation fellowship, they, they, they worship Divine Mother, or, you know, whatever their idea of a Divine Mother is. For yogis, say they, it's not a person, it's the, it's the cosmic life force that energizes nature. But many people picture Divine Mother as a human cosmic mother figure. You know? Then I can never relate to that. But if it makes them happy, it's all right. So it doesn't really matter the form of divinity or focus, form of our focus, because eventually we're going to go past, we're going to go beyond that anyway. So it helps us get focus. And then we let that go and go beyond it. You know the story of Ramakrishna. Yeah, he was a priest in Kali Temple in Jakshinaswar near Calcutta. And he worshipped the form of Divine Mother. Pray to Divine Mother, chant Divine Mother's name, light candles and wave incense and do all of that. And when he meditated, he would see this image in his mind, he would see this picture of a feminine form, a celestial feminine form that was very attractive, and he would just stay there and couldn't get past that. And a yogi came, came, came along one day and uh, sat and meditated with him and uh, said, what, what is your experience? And Ramakrishna said, I see Divine Mother, she glows. And uh, the yogi picked up a stone from the ground and put it through his eyebrows. He said, go, go through there. And that shock was enough. He said that the, the image faded and he experienced a transcendent shape. This is what he called miracle of the samadhi. So he, he experienced going beyond. He couldn't do it on his own, but that was extra shock that he got from the, from the yogi who said, do it this way. That pushed him through it. But many people, they get to a certain stage of, oh, this is lovely, and they stop there. Mm -hmm. you know. And or they do Kriya Pranayama, and they feel, they feel the energy flows that are very pleasant. And they, and they, they say, oh, this must be the bliss of self realization Well, it's not. It's just an energy arousal. It's a very pleasant sensation. It's very pleasant. But it's not the end of the of the meditation process. So we just whatever we experience when we're meditating, it's always helpful to ask, is there anything beyond this? What is beyond this? Until we get to the place where there's nothing else beyond. But if we stop part way. Then we, that's not useful. If you want to be liberated, if you want to be spiritually enlightened, we don't want to stop part way. Master used to say, public gathering, Master used to say, to remind people, he said, let your devotion be like a, a wood fire that burns long and steady, and not like a straw fire that goes, flashes up and goes out like that. And so my experience is it's just a matter of staying on the right track and being patient, being patient. And Sri Cheswar, he defined patience as emotional stability.
being emotionally stable. So we want to be spiritually awake, but when I was visiting the Master, he said, you have to want, he said, he put it very simple, he said, you have to want God, but you have to want realization. With all, um, with all of your heart, <clears throat> with all of your heart. <clears throat> and so much so that you can't wait one more day to have that experience. Then you say, but you have to be patient just in case, just in case it doesn't happen that day. So it's a balance that, yes, I want it, I want it, I want it, and yet patience, if it doesn't break open that day, it's all right, it, it will, it, sooner or later. Everyone wakes up sooner or later, everyone becomes enlightened. It'll happen to everyone. And uh, but if we just stay with it, stay with it, stay really peaceful, emotionally sound, and just stay with it in the right way, eventually we break through. So, I had the idea for that meditation temple many years ago. I uh, lectured in, used to, used to speak in Germany every year, and I was flying back from Germany, from Frankfurt, and I was just making sketch, sketching, making sketches on a, on, a note, on a notepad, and I thought, well, I have something special on the grounds and uh, there at CSA, and so I sketched, I sketched out an eight-sided building, uh, and uh, stained glass windows for seven major world religions. And I came back and I talked to our local local man who was a con building contractor and asked him for a price on it and gave him a price and I said, go ahead. Then I found a uh, person about 20 miles from here who had just recently at that time started doing stained glass work. Before that, he had been a jeweler who had been working in gold, doing making rings and bracelets and so forth. But he was curious about stained glass, and so he started making stained glass. And he had, he had done, done a beautiful stained glass church, a uh, clay window for a, a new Catholic church. I saw it. So I talked to him and I said, that's what I would like you to do. I said, uh, I, my only idea is to have a symbol of each faith in the middle, in a circle. But you do the research and find out the the, the uh, religious symbolism and the cultural influence with the design, which he did. And he uh, turned out he was a, uh, he wasn't a yogi, but he was very open to yoga. He was, uh, he was a meditator and he, uh, he was working on another project and, he, and so he was able to create one every one a month. And he would draw the sketch on a big sheet of paper and then look, cut the glass and place it on the sketch and have me look at it. And then I said, okay, that, that looks good. And then he, he put it together and bring it in the solid. And he, I think he did a good job. And uh, it was his first so. We were, we were fortunate to find him right nearby. So, and after I saw it, when it was finished, I thought, gee, it'd be nice to have one this big. A big, big, big sanctuary with the, with the stained glass. That would be very nice. So we had, we had, we had already built this for this time. We, we, we built this in 1976. So. All right, so I'll see you a little later. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much.